Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Inside the Beltway this morning, I'm so glad you joined me. I want to talk with you about this book, David Brooks's brand new How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. David joins me now. Hello, David. How are you? It's good to be with you again. It's good to talk to you. David, I am, um, I'm used to getting books, and I got yours for free. They get sent to me. I want to tell you I'm going to buy six copies of How to Know a Person, three for my children and their spouses, and three for friends who are no longer friends that I want them to read. I wonder if you've had other people tell you that they're going to be buying your book to give to other people. Yeah, uh, thank you for being generous on Twitter about the book. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I've had people buy it for all their employees. I've had it buy, people buy it for the families. I haven't heard about buying it for ex-friends, but it's a good strategy. Uh, you know, we just live it in is. these brutalizing times. And my book is, is supposed to be a, a, a missile directed right at that. It's about the, the precise skills of how do you get to know someone? How do you make them feel respected, seen, heard? How do you make them feel respected, seen, and heard? I know why my friends are not my friends anymore. It's because of Donald Trump. They thought me insufficiently outraged about Donald Trump. And I can't bridge that gap, right? I can't be other than what I am, which is I voted for him twice. And if he's the nominee, I'll vote for him again. But they don't understand it. And I don't know that they're trying to understand. I don't understand them either. But I think how to know a person has assisted me. So congratulations. Let me also tell you, I told our mutual friend, Bob Barnett, that I was telling people about your book in Miami as I prepared for the debate because my wife and I talked about one statistic in particular, one paragraph actually, on page 98. 36% of Americans reported they felt lonely frequently or almost all of the time, including 61% of young adults, 51% of young mothers. The percentage of Americans who said they have no close friends quadrupled between 1990 and 2020. 54% of Americans reported that no one knows them well. That is an extraordinary raft of terrible news, David. Yeah, and I found it's hard to build a healthy democracy on top of a rotting society. And so when people are filled with loneliness and sadness, it turns into meanness. Because if you feel yourself unseen and visible, there's nothing crueler than feeling that people think you don't exist. And you get angry and you lash out. And we have these school shootings. We have bitter politics. We've got the brutality of what's happening on college campuses right now, where Jewish students are being blockaded uh, out of classrooms, or have the recipients of, of genocidal death threats. And so suddenly, nobody has taught them the basic social skills of how to build a friendship, how to make people feel that you're, you're included. And these are basic social skills, like the kind you could be taught at like learning carpentry or tennis or something like that. It's how do you listen well? How do you disagree well? How do you sit with someone who's got depression? How do you sit with someone who's contemplating suicide? How do you sit with someone who disagrees with you fundamentally on issues? And I just try to walk through the basic skills. Uh, and in my view, there in any group of people, there, there are two ser- sorts. There's diminishers, the people who stereotype, ignore, they don't ask you questions, they just don't care about you. And then there's another sort of person who are illuminators and they are curious about you, they respect you, they wanna know your life story and they make you feel lit up and heard. And my goal in writing the book was partly social, because we need these skills to be a decent society, and partly personal. I just want to be better at at being an illuminator. I I think it comes through in the book. I listened to your interview with Katie Couric and her colleague, who I don't know, and they were trying to get at a question a couple of times. I'm going to try and land that plane. Why did David Brooks write this book? Well, I'll give you the personal reason. You know, some people, if anybody watched Fiddler on the Roof, you know how warm and huggy Jewish families can be. Uh, I grew up in the other kind of Jewish family, and our culture was think Yiddish, act British. So we were super, we had love in the home. We just didn't express it. We were not a huggy family. We were all cerebral up here. Uh, And then when I was 18, the admissions officers of Columbia, Wesley and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago, which was also a super cerebral place. Uh, and my favorite saying about Chicago, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. And so, you know, I went into the world of journalism where we just aloof and watch stuff. And I realized as a, f- a favorite novelist of mine, Frederick Buechner once put it, if you cut yourself off from true connection with others, you may save yourself a little pain because you won't be betrayed, but you're cutting yourself off from the holy sources of life itself. And so I just yeah, want to be um... intimate with other people. 
I, I've heard you now three times, read in your book, heard you tell it to Katie and heard you tell it to me, the anecdote about the University of Chicago, the anecdote about Yiddish and British. But what is new is you brought up Beekner. And I, I've never read Beekner. I now know his backstory, which is so tragic. You included it in the book. I, d I did not know he had a tragic backstory that illumines his character for me. And maybe I will go and read it. But you're in interview mode. How many different book interviews have you done? Uh, probably 20 or more. I don't know, yeah. a lot. <clears throat> you're, you're definitely, I know what that's like, where you want to get through an interview and you want to make sure that people, you land the, the point. And I'm, I, I want to get a little bit deeper than that. I want to find out if you're done with your self-examination. There's been a David Brooks self-examination underway for a long time, but you, you have not yet written your book about God. Are you going to go there? Yeah, well, I, and at the end of The Second Mountain, I wrote a book about my spiritual journey and how I grew up, my phrase was, uh, religiously bisexual. So I grew up in a Jewish home, <laughs> but I went to a church school and I went to a church camp. So I had the story of Jesus in my head and the story of Moses in my head. And it didn't matter because I didn't believe in God. And then when I was 50 or so, reality seemed porous to me. It seemed like we're not just a bunch of physical molecules. Uh, you know, I once, um, I was in subway in New York City in God's ugliest spot on the face of the earth. And I look around the subway car and I see all these people and I decide all these people have souls. There's some piece of them that has no size, weight, color or shape, but gives them infinite value and dignity. And their souls could be soaring, their souls could be hurting, but all of us have them. And once you have the concept of the soul in your head, it doesn't take long before the concept of God is in your head. And so I went off, especially about 10 years ago, and that's still going on, a spiritual journey of just trying to figure out what do I believe? And I learned that when, you, um, when you're on a journey like that, uh, Christians give you books. And so I got like <laughs> 700 books sent to me, only 350 of which were different copies of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And so like that was my journey. And it didn't, um, it, it was very slow and gradual. There wasn't, there were some dramatic moments, but not a lot. But I realized, oh, I'm not an atheist anymore. Uh, and my heart has opened up to something. And I think this book is the extension of that. When your heart opens up to God, and if every person you meet, you think this person was made in the image of God, I'm looking at somebody so important, Jesus was willing to die for that person, then I've got to show them the respect that God would show them. I've got to try to see them with the eyes that Jesus would see them with. And that's a super high standard that I'm not going to meet. But it's a goal. And, and Jesus says, even in brutal, tough times, he sees people. He sees the poor. And the main thing he does is Jesus is always asking questions. Somebody asks him a question, he asks them a question back. And that act of questioning, what you do for a living, you, that's, that's a show of respect. And that's the doorway to seeing someone. And so to me, I think questions are a moral act that we're phenomenal at when we're kids. Uh, and then we get a little worse at it. And I come sometimes leave a party and think that whole time, nobody asked me a question. And I've come to think like only 30% of the, the people in the world are question askers. And so part of the thing I do in the book is just try to say, here are some great, here's how to be a great question asker. It, it'll, it's a morally generous thing to do to ask people questions. It is a, that is the key takeaway, how to ask questions. And this is a skill set. I, I sent a note this morning to my friend, Jan Janer, who has been running a Christian ministry for 30 years called uh, The Wild Adventure. He wrote a book called Turning Small Talk into Big Talk, and I was reminded of it. It's a, yours is a longer, more um, complicated examination of the art of asking questions and why you want to do so. It's also, it reminded me a lot of C.S. Lewis, The Weight of Glory. You've never met an ordinary human being. Everyone is an eternal horror and everlasting splendor. And you believe that, and you get to it. and. I want to talk about how one gets there, but I want to begin, interestingly enough, with a, with a comment Katie Couric made you. And I listened to that yesterday. I'd finished your book last week, and I made my notes last night, and then I listened to the Katie Couric interview. She spontaneously brought up her interview with Sarah Palin. Why do you think she did that, yeah. David? I like Katie a lot, yeah. and, and we've, she, she's been a guest on my show. I loved her memoir, at least the first two-thirds of it, which was about her younger life, which I thought was fascinating. Why do you think she brought up the Sarah Palin interview? I was also struck by that because I don't think she talks about it enough. I know Katie from various things, and I don't think she talks about it all that much. I think it was a time when she was asking questions and somebody just wasn't answering. It was a time when 
she was having a miscommunication. I, I imagine that's what, that's why she wrote up. Do you have another theory? I do. I, I think it's because she's been misunderstood because of that question and that she wants people who only know Katie Couric because of that question to know that that's not Katie Couric. And that, uh, to me, it was it made perfect sense. She needs to be known. And that's the central theme of this. People want to be seen. They want to be known. And if, you are, uh, if you're known for the wrong thing, in this case, right. the Katie Couric, Sarah Palin interview, you want, to, you want to get that off your cargo ship, right? You want that unloaded. And I thought, wow, you really, the book worked on her. Um, let me tell you also, on page 134, you talk about face experiments with infants. I want them outlawed, David. What did you think when you read it? I, I think those are cruel and awful. Tell people about them. Yeah, so babies come out of the womb uh, wanting to be seen. Uh, if, uh, baby's eyes, they see ev everything 18 inches away in sharpness. Everything else is kind of blurry because they want to see mom's face. And these experiments that you referred to are called still face experiments. The babies send a bid for attention and the moms are instructed, don't respond, just be still face. And in the beginning, the babies are uncomfortable. And then after a few seconds, they start writhing around and, and within five seconds, they're in total agony because nobody is seeing them. And I really don't think it's that much different as adults. I think when we're unseen, uh, it is just total agony. We're rendered invisible. And that's what I encounter in my daily life as a reporter. You know, I, I used to go to the Midwest. I live on the East Coast, but I spent a lot of time in the Midwest. And maybe 10, 15 years ago, once a day, somebody would say, you guys think we're flyover country. In the last five or years, I hear that like 10 times a day. And so a lot of just people feel they're invisible. And frankly, that's a little on my profession, the media. When I started as a police reporter in Chicago, uh, we had working class folks uh, in the newsroom. Our reporters, they hadn't gone to college. They were just regular people from Chicago, and they covered crime alongside me. Now, if you go to newsrooms, especially in New York, D.C., L.A., San Francisco, it's not only that everybody went to college. Everyone went to the same, like, 15 elite colleges and a lot of the same prep schools. So if you're not in this little group, and you look at the national media and you don't see yourself, it's as if they're telling you your voice doesn't matter, you don't exist. Uh, and that's a form of dehumanization that we've allowed to fester in this country. And of course, people are going to lash out. Yeah, I, I just spent two weeks with really wonderful professionals at NBC preparing for this debate. And at one point, I asked one of my colleagues in this exercise, I don't work for NBC, how many people do you think in this room voted for Trump? And taken aback, they did not answer because the answer is obvious. Nobody. And if, if your newsroom is full of 100% of people who not only didn't vote for Trump, but actually loathe him, you can't cover the country. It's impossible because you're not seeing the other 50%. And what your book is, I hope the newsroom's distributed as well, we are all about seeing people who have long been marginalized, and that is important. But if you don't see people who are supporting Donald Trump for whatever reason, you can't cover the news. Let me ask you about um, this Philip Lewis fellow. Um, I love him because he, he finally gave me the courage to teach the, do, the dormant commerce clause in the 11th Amendment with the confidence that even though my students are terribly bored, they have to know this. Where did you meet Philip Lewis? Because he, he's talking to teachers. Teachers need to read this book too, if only to be comforted in the fact that every teacher has this experience. Yeah, well, we go through institutions. I've never met him, but I read a book by him. Uh, I may have exchanged emails with him. And he's talking about the different phases of life. And sometimes you're in a phase of life where you're in the career consolidation phase. You just want to build your career, build your name, build your identity. And you're looking for hits. You're looking to be popular. But then after a certain point in life, you hit what you might call the institutional phase or the generative phase. You want to serve an institution. You want to serve a body of truth. You want to have a legacy. And so Philip Lewis said, you know, I'm a teacher, and I used to think the boring parts of the class, I hated them because the students would, didn't like it, and I wanted to be popular. And then he realized, if I'm going to honor what I'm teaching, the body of knowledge of what I'm teaching, then I've got to, I'm going to go through the boring parts. And they may be boring, but they're important to the service of educating people. It's important to the institution. It's important to the body of knowledge. And that yeah. institutional phase is a phase of, of giving and serving and it takes a lot of, and people have to go through a transition of consciousness to go from the me 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 phase 
to the, no, I'm serving this institution phase. Uh, and so what I took away from you, that is I wrote down, it's important to be an entertaining teacher, but you're not an entertainer. And so you, you have to sometimes bore the living daylights out of your students. And so I, I thank Philip for that. I want to make sure I get to a few things with you, David. Number one, how many times, just make a rough guess, how many panels have you been on? In your, we're about the same age, so I, I have a guess, but how many panels do you think in which you have participated? Uh, more than there are stars in the heavens. <laughs> I do a lot of panels, and most of them are in Washington, so they're like on fiscal policy, super exciting subjects. So when the panel convenes, they either have a very long introduction or a short introduction or no introduction. Which one of the, each panelist, which do you prefer, the long intro, the medium, or the short? Short as possible. The long ones, A, always have factual errors, and B, nobody's listening. <laughs> And here's what I took away from your book about how big is the mountain. Well, first, why don't you tell the story about uh, affordances, because it's a new word. I've never heard the word affordances until I read How to Know a Person, and then talk about the mountain experiment, because to me, that's a revelation. Yeah, and it was to me, too. So there's a guy named Dennis Prophet who teaches at UVA, and he asked students to estimate the, the grade of the hills on campus there. And the students... Oh, generally overestimate. So it's a 5% grade hill. They think it's a 20% grade hill. But one day, Prophet's researchers were interviewing students and they got it exactly right. They said, no, that's a 5% grade hill. And he was wondering, how did the students suddenly get so smart? It turned out that day they were interviewing the members of the Division I women's varsity soccer team. And so these were extremely fit athletes. And so walking up a hill would be no problem. So they saw it more accurately than the students who were less fit. And the general rule, which is going to seem insignificant at first, but now, now I think is very significant, how, very. We perceive, how we perceive a situation depends on what we can do in a situation. And so if you're hunting with a bow and arrow, you see a different field than if you're hunting with a, with a rifle. Uh, and so that matters because we all have different capacities in any situation. A rich person walks into Neiman Marcus and sees a different store than the poor person because they can afford to buy the stuff there. Uh, when I was teaching at Yale, my students would look at campus and see a different campus than the, the folks who lived in New Haven but who were not Yale affiliated uh, because they, they were comfortable with it. And for the folks who were unaffiliated, Yale looked like this intimidating fortress. And so how we see a situation depends on the models in our head. We don't see with our eyes, we see with our whole life. And if I'm gonna get to know you, I've got to know, how do you see this? Because it's probably going to be very different than how I see it. One of my favorite little one-liners in the book is a guy's on one side of the river, and there's a woman on the other side of the river, and she screams him, how do I get to the other side of the river? And he screams back at her, you are on the other side of the river. And so many of us can't perceive the world from another person's point of view. And so that's part well, of the job, and it's to acknowledge that some people are seeing very different realities than we're seeing. That's why I asked you about panels because I am one of the most impatient people in the world about introductions. I hate them, but I've come to realize that the person making the introduction has a role to play and a meaning to, um, to grab by, by virtue of that. And people who don't like panels, who are afraid of public speaking, might need that time to collect and gather their thoughts. But the affordance that you and I see Oh, we have an opportunity to hold forth, and we can't wait to hold forth. Our opinions matter, and these people will listen to us. Let's get going. But the right. the moderator or the introducer and the other people on the panel, they might be completely different from you and I or are completely comfortable in that. I think that's a revolutionary kind of understanding of when you walk into a room or into any situation. Curious. Anyone else who's interviewed you brought that up yet? Uh, nobody at all. I'm very pleased to be able to talk about that, so I appreciate that. I, I think... Uh, did you know the word affordance before you, you read that work? No, I had never heard of it. I, I read this book by, called Perception by Dennis Prophet, and then he, he goes back. It, it, the word was invented by a guy named J.J. Gibson, who was hired by the Air Force to un help understand how pilots see aircraft carriers when they land it. And he realized they see the carrier differently than you and I because they have to land a plane. And so they see a, the flat top. They see something that's different than because they're doing what they're what the situation affords. They're doing what they need to do depending on what they're capable of doing. 
I think that is a mountain-sized revelation on how people are seeing the world and how they see us in, in every situation. Let me go to page 210. I have a civil war going on inside my, uh, inside, this is David Brooks writing, I have a civil war going on inside between my generative consciousness I aspire to and that little imperial ego that I can, cannot quite leave behind. I suspect I'm not alone in this. You are not. <laughs> okay, I can say that with great certainty because I've got the same civil war. Explain to people what that means. Yeah, so I wrote a book called The Second Mountain a few years ago. And it was all about how you should not worry about the worldly success. You should think about divine uh, goodness and, and being Christ-like. And so I wrote that book about don't worry about worldly success. Then I'm chicken, checking my Amazon ranking every hour to see how it's selling. So clearly it's not working great on me. And then in this book, it's all about how do you be a really good questioner? How do you get people to tell you their life story? And I walk into a dinner party. I think, yeah, I'm going to be an illuminator. I'm really going to let them shine. And then I have a couple glasses of wine. I start telling funny stories about myself. And it all, it all goes away. So the ego is a super hard thing to corral. And I, I'm a work in progress on that front. Years ago, Joseph Epstein, my favorite writer. I'm sorry you're not him, uh, David. My favorite writer is Joseph Epstein, who refuses to be interviewed, by the way. Absolutely refuses to be interviewed on the radio. And Joseph Epstein introduced me to a quote by Ian e. Forster. You know you're being influenced when you read something and say to yourself, I might have written that myself if I'd had more time. Well, I couldn't have written this because I haven't read all these books and I'm not a psychologist and I'm not capable of understanding it. But I sure do believe in the questions that get people to open up. Yours is where do you grow? Where did you grow up? Mine is where are you from? Because where are you from usually will generate a, a reality check on whether they identify with their place of birth or where they're living. Where did you grow up actually gets to the heart of the matter because where you grew up is everything. Do you think where you grew up is everything, David Brooks? Yeah, I agree. And people love to talk about their childhoods. We're too shy about asking that question. But if you say, where did you grow up? Suddenly they're talking about their town, their family, the things that really made them who they are. We all like go through childhood twice. We go through it as kids. And then we have to go back and figure out what it meant. And so I'm trying to get them, tell me what it meant. Uh, and so that's that would be one of my questions. Some of the other questions are, um, tell me your favorite unimportant thing about yourself. I asked that of somebody recently, and they told me how much trashy reality TV they watch. Another huh. conversation I, I just had was, uh, how did your ancestors show up in your life? And so we're all shaped by our, our heritages. And I asked that question at a dinner party, and there was a Dutch family that talked about Dutch heritage. There's a black family that talked about African-American heritage. I talked about 5,000 years of Jewish history. We just got to know each other a lot better. And so that book you held up, How to Turn Small Talk into Big Conversation, that really is a crucial skill. We want to have conversations that we're going to remember. And I mean, it's what you do on the program, but not, not just small talk. I like small talk, frankly, but I want to have big conversations that I'll, I'll leave and I'll think, wow, that guy, that guy was an amazing guy. I'm so glad I got to meet him. But you know, it's interesting, David, if we had met and I didn't know anything about you, you and I would end up talking about baseball for an hour and never learn anything about each other because small talk becomes a wall over which many people cannot climb. Uh, I have to tell you a story and get you to react to it. Uh, I'm Roman Catholic. My wife is Presbyterian. So on Sunday, I went to Mass at 7. Then I went to the Presbyterian Church with her, where we, after services, heard a rabbi talk about Jewish prayer. And in the course of this, a rabbi I've never met before knocked me stone cold over by revealing, because it was appropriate to reveal, that he and his wife had three grandchildren born in the same period about 10 weeks ago, and one of them died. And he paused and he talked about what that was like. Nobody in the room knew this very wise, extraordinary teacher, by the way, a gifted, gifted teacher, was carrying this great burden of sorrow. And I was ready for it because I, I had just read your book, and we really don't know what people carry into every room. And I don't know whether or not we want to know. What do you think? Do we want to know? I did. I'm glad the rabbi told us that. In fact, I'm going to have lunch with him this week to, to follow up with him because it's it's such a horrible thing and, and such a, a vulnerable thing to share with people. But do you think people want us to know their sorrows? Yes. Uh, people, especially in hard circumstances, they desperately want somebody else to be there with them. And so I, I had a friend who, who had a daughter who died of a horseback riding accident in Afghanistan and all places. And the daughter's name was Anna. And she said to me once, you know, people uh, don't always know whether they should mention Anna to me because they're afraid of bringing up a painful subject but they should know that Anna is always on my mind. 
And sir, if you mention her, then I, if I feel like talking about her, I will talk about her. If I don't feel like talking about her, I won't talk about her. But if you mention her, you've given me the opportunity. And the other story she said as she was grieving, she said, do you want to know what the weirdly the best thing that happened to me in that grieving process was? Somebody came to visit me, brought me a casserole or whatever, and then they went to the bathroom and they noticed we didn't have a bath mat in the bathroom. And so they went out to Target, they bought a bath mat, and they just put it in. They didn't even tell me. And she said, that kind of little practical help, that made me feel seen. Uh, and so I think when, you, when you're with someone who's suffered a loss, there's not much you can say to make it better, but you can just acknowledge the, the, the situation. This sucks. You know, this, uh, this is terrible. years ago, David, the first television series I did for National was something called Searching for God in America and for PBS in 1996. I got to chat with Dr. with Harold Kushner, the rabbi who wrote When Good Things Happen to Bad People. And I don't remember much about it except he said, when people are suffering, show up and shut up. Don't say anything. And especially, don't be a topper. And when I read in, in this book, I finally have a way to phrase it to people. Don't be a topper. I didn't know quite what it, you crystallized. So explain to people what it means, don't be a topper. Because if nothing else, people need to hear this. Don't be a topper. Yeah, so we'll do two levels of topperness. Uh, the first one is if you tell me you're having a problem with your teenage kid, I say, oh, I know exactly where you're going through. I'm having a problem with my Tommy. And it sounds like I'm just trying to relate, but what, I, what I'm really doing is saying, let's stop talking about you, let's talk about me. And so that's being a topper on the minor league level. The major league topper happens when somebody suffers a loss, in his case, or somebody's going through cancer, and they, you realize they're going through, they've just lost their sister, say. And you say, oh, I know what you're going through. My dog died. And when somebody t tells you something terrible that happened, no comparisons. Never do comparisons. Just never, never do it. Just say, well, tell me about your sister. That's all you got to do. Tell me about your sister. And if they feel like saying, they will. If they don't, they won't. But you've given them an option. And you haven't tried to hog or appropriate their experience. Uh, that is, people, stop right now, take that away, and ask yourself, because I do it. I, I'm guilty. The first inclination is to try and reach someone in their sorrow by identifying with them, but it's actually the wrong thing to do. And Harold, I, I stop myself before I top often, but the, uh, the topperism is rampant among us. David, your time is precious, so I want to make sure uh, I get to this, the night sea journey. Um, you talk about the Night Sea journey at page 162. To know a person well, you have to know who they were before they suffered their losses and how they remade their whole outlook after them. The question is, when do you begin that process? Because it's not something you can start. Even if you met someone a half dozen times, you can't start it. When, when do you start it? Yeah. Well, you know, I used to think wisdom was the capacity to have a bunch of maxims that you could spew out to people that would help them guide their life. And I, say, I love maxims, so if somebody gives me a maxim. But now I think wisdom is the capacity to be receptive. It's to wisely receive. It's to know when somebody's ready, to reveal vulnerability in an appropriate place. So if somebody has suffered a great loss, the death of a spouse, wisdom is understanding where they are and letting them lead. And so think of the way a pianist accompanies a singer. The singer is leading the presentation and the accompanist, the pianist, is alongside for the ride, an other-centered way of being. So if somebody's gone, gone through some suffering, I'm sort of there for the ride. I'm just being present. And if they want to open up and describe, then I'm happy to have them do it. And when people are going through loss, basically all the models in their head are outdated. Because I, had, I was having dinner with a friend who lost his wife. And he, as we left the restaurant, we had a great conversation. He said, I can't wait to tell my, my wife. And then I realized that wasn't going to happen because she had died. And so he's got to go through that process of including his wife in his heart as one of the things, the great blessings of his life, but as something that was in the past. And he's got to re-update re his models for the life that he now is going to live. You know, you just called to mind. I don't want to know the name of the person, but you have a friend who when someone suffered a public disgrace, they took them to dinner weekly for two years. That is yeah. a friend indeed, because that is to, to put yourself in harm's way with the disgraced person. I don't know that I'm capable of that. Were you, uh, do you find that astonishing? I, I don't know that I, I thought of all the disgraced people I've known or heard of all these years, and there's a long list of them, right? People who are publicly disgraced. 
to go out with them for every week for two years. That's a saint. Yeah, yeah no, it's really a beautiful act of service. And, you know, I have friends with a guy who was disgraced, and I tried to be nice to him. I went out to lunch with him occasionally. But it was not a regular thing of making him feel included. And, there, you know, I tell a story in the book about a woman named Jillian who lost her dad. And she yeah. was at a wedding, and she, it was time for the father-daughter dance, and she just couldn't handle it. Uh, and so she, she goes in the ladies' room to have a cry. And when she comes out, everybody at her table and at the next table were just standing there in the hallway. And she says, and she wrote in a paper, she gave me permission to quote, she said, what I will always remember is that nobody said a thing. They just gave me a hug. They didn't linger to validate or to justify themselves or to validate my grief. They just were there for me, giving me a hug in silence, and it was exactly what I needed. And she'll it's a wonderful that story. Your life. My, my son just got married two weeks ago, and I thought of that story when I was reading this. I want to close by going big, David, to the world in which we find ourselves. I'm going to leave from here and go down to the March for Israel on the Mall. And the reason I'm doing that is because I can't stop thinking about baby Kavir and the toddlers because I'm a grandfather and I have little, little tiny children and I can't go on. At the same time, I can't let it go past without saying I'm with you. But as I read your book, I was reading in parallel a new book, a relatively new book that came out last year called The Pope at War. Uh, Francis has opened up the Vatican's archives on Pius XII. And it occurs to me that at the time of the war, the Catholic hierarchy could not see Jews. They could see Italians. They could see people close, but they could not see, they could not imagine it. And that brings me up to the present. I don't know that these monsters in Hamas can actually see the people that they butchered or the hostages that they are holding. Is, is that the problem, that there's just, that they've lost their ability to see anything on the other side of the fence? Yeah, I think a, a label and ideology can be very dehumanizing. Somebody interviewed one of the guys who committed the Rwandan genocide, who macheted his neighbor of 25 years. And you told, that's the in the book, said, yeah. Yeah, what, what did you see when you macheted your neighbor? And he said, well, the, the person's face got all blurry. It wasn't really the person I'd been living next to. And that's the ultimate form of dehumanization. And the Hamas guys have been so dehumanized by hate, they can rape a girl, they can put an infant in the oven and roast it. Uh, this is the most extreme and ugly form of dehumanization. But we're also seeing ugly forms of dehumanization in this country. And I'm, I was with, I'm in Miami right now, and I, I was with an older Jewish woman who just, she was progressive. And she says, all my life I've felt I've had brothers and sisters, and now I realize I'm totally alone. That there's nobody there to see her in her moment of turmoil and grief. And instead there's just been this wave of anti-Semitism. And what is anti-Semitism? It's dehumanization. And the DEI offices on campuses are not there to, for diversity, equity, inclusion. They're there for an ideology of dehumanization, that you're either oppressor, oppressed, colonizer, or colonized. And so what we need in this country is a movement of genuine pluralism that says, no, I'm not going to dehumanize you. I will actually be curious about you. I will ask your life story. And all the people who are withdrawing from money from the universities, I'm sort of glad they're doing it, but I wish they would invest in something to counter DEI which would be an office of pluralism, of genuine seeing, of genuine conversation. And that's the only way I see our universities maintaining some equilibrium here. Yeah, I would, uh, I would suggest that they fund freshman seminars where everyone begins by reading how to know a person, and they begin by getting to know the people in that seminar so that they would actually understand with whom they are attending college and that college actually be what it is. Well done, David Brooks. It's a magnificent book. Success to you. It's very hard to start a book tour in the middle of a, an international calamity. I don't know how you're doing it, but good luck to you in, in carrying it through. Thank you. You've been very generous. I'm really appreciative. Thank you. My pleasure. David Brooks, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen, available in bookstores everywhere.